And so now, uh, without further ado, uh, Sarah McBride. Thank you. It's on. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for, for coming out during your lunch break. It's wonderful to be here at Google. My brother-in-law works in the New York office, so it's great to be with family. Uh, my name's Sarah McBride. Uh, I'm the National Press Secretary at the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization. I am 27 years old. I'm a native of Wilmington, Delaware, a proud graduate of American University, and I'm a transgender woman. It took me 21 years to muster up the courage to say those last two words, transgender woman. Today, they are among my proudest identities, and this afternoon, I can stand before you as the person that I am. But of course, I don't have to tell you that it hasn't always been that way. I remember as a child lying in my bed at night, praying that I would wake up the next day and be myself to just have my family be proud of me, and to still be able to pursue my dreams. I was a big reader of history growing up, and in reading the history books, it became abundantly clear to me that no one quite like me had ever made it very far, at least no one who was out. And growing up, it was clear as the sky is blue that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive. And so I kept that fact inside. I told myself that if I could make it worthwhile for other people for me to stay in the closet by making a difference in this world, by making my family proud, that those things would somehow bring me wholeness and completeness. I think one of the challenges we have in the fight for trans equality that differs in the fight for gay equality is that people who aren't transgender have a difficult time understanding what it feels like to have a gender identity that differs from your sex assigned at birth. For straight folks, they understand, generally speaking, what it's like to love and to lust, and there's an entry point into empathizing with gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer individuals who aren't transgender. But because they don't necessarily have that analogous experience for the experience of being in the closet as a trans person, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And for me, and while every journey is different and every experience is different, for me, being in the closet, not being seen and affirmed as my whole self by society felt like a constant feeling of homesickness. That unwavering ache in the pit of my stomach that would only go away when I could be seen and affirmed as myself. And unlike homesickness with physical location, which dissipates with time and getting used to your new surroundings, this homesickness would only increase with distance. During uh, my sophomore year in college, after moving down to DC from my home state of Delaware, I was elected president of the student body of American University. And it was through that experience, it was through advocating on a number of issues, including LGBTQ equality, that it became clear that the things I told myself would make me feel whole and complete, making a difference in this world, that those things wouldn't actually fill the void in my life. And at a certain point, that homesickness had become so all-encompassing that my gender identity was a reality, was a fact that I thought about every single waking hour of every single day. I remember sitting in church on Christmas Eve night with my parents, listening to the choir sing and looking up at the stained glass windows and just knowing that I couldn't spend any more time missing the beauty in this world. I couldn't spend any more time watching my life pass by me without fully living as myself. And so I didn't waste any time. I came out to my parents the next day on Christmas Day in 2011. I kind of ruined Christmas. But you know what? It was a big present for them that they were not expecting. And while my parents struggled with my news, while my parents made clear that they really wished this wasn't the path that we were on, that they loved me and that they would support me in every step of the way. My parents, they, they feared rejection in every sense of the word, and we sat down and we talked for the next several days as they went through a mourning period. It, it sort of felt like I was dying to them. So I sat down with them and I asked them every question while simultaneously listening to their cries and telling them that there was nothing I could do about this, that this was who I am and this was, these were the steps that I'd need to take. 
And so I answered every question, mostly beginning with, are you sure? And I said, I'm as sure as of the fact that I love you. They asked my dad, a progressive uh, asked me, he said, I don't quite understand. One of the things that I feel like we've learned is that gender is a social construct. And how do you feel a gender identity? How do you have a deeply held sense of a gender identity if gender is a social construct? And I told my dad that for me, gender is a lot like language. Language itself is a social construct. Every single word has been created by humankind, but language expresses very real things. The feeling of happiness, that sensation is very real. The word happiness is a social construct. And just like with gender, where there are an infinite number of ways to express an individual deeply held sense of your gender identity, with language, with every individual feeling, there's an infinite number of ways to express that feeling, whether it's in the different words you use, or the different construction of sentences, or the nonverbals. And gender, in many ways, operates the same way. And so these conversations, they could help my parents intellectualize this news, but it, it didn't solve the fact that they were scared. But with the courage and confidence that, that my family gave me in May of 2012, during the last day of my term as student body president at American University, I announced to the broader campus community that I was Sarah in an op-ed in the AU student newspaper. I was very scared and nervous about the university's response. This was 2012. It was well before what Time Magazine called the transgender tipping point. And I had seen the university welcome gay, lesbian, and bisexual students pretty seamlessly, but I wasn't quite sure how they'd respond to a transgender student, let alone a transgender student body president. And almost immediately after posting that note and then posting the op-ed, the messages of love and support began to come in from students across campus. And when I was student body president, I always said that our college campuses should look like the country we want to build in 10 or 15 years. And what was amazing was that on that night in 2012, AU was trying to send a message to the country, which is that while we may still be learning about transgender identities and while we may not totally understand transgender experiences, this is how you respond, with love, with acceptance, and with support. One student commented that the joy on campus sort of felt like we had just won a sports championship, which I don't know how we would know because AU doesn't actually win sports championships. <laughs> but it was just an overwhel overwhelming sense of joy and love. And it became abundantly clear to me that as difficult as it was for me to come out, it was relatively easy compared to the experience of far too many transgender people across this country, particularly transgender folks living at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities. And so I wanted to make sure moving forward that the privileges that I had in coming out, of keeping my family, of being able to continue at my school, of being safe from violence, that those would no longer be a privilege, but rather a right guaranteed to every single person, no matter their sexual orientation or gender identity. Because it shouldn't be a privilege to keep your family. It shouldn't be a privilege to be able to keep your job or stay in school because you come out as transgender. It shouldn't be a privilege to be safe from violence. So I moved back to my home state of Delaware. I began working with our state's Equality Organization, Equality Delaware, because at that time, Delaware was one of a majority of states in this country that still lacked clear and explicit protections from discrimination for, tra uh, for transgender people. And to this day, a majority of states in the federal government still lack those same explicit protections for LGBTQ people more broadly. And so day in and day out, we went down to the state legislature. And I started out telling these legislators about all of the stack stats and all of the statistics and all of the facts. But as I watched my parents connect with these legislators, I realized that my job wasn't to offer the most cogent case. My job was to offer the most compelling case. And at the end of the day, stories have the power to make change. Vulnerability, I learned, was oftentimes, is oftentimes our best path toward justice and equality. Because vulnerability, it transcends geography, it transcends ideology, it transcends race, religion, gender. Everyone understands what it feels like to be vulnerable. Everyone understands what it feels like to be othered. Everyone understands what it feels like 
to be scared. They don't want that for themselves, and hopefully they don't want that for other people. And so by telling our stories, it became abundantly clear to these legislators that behind this national conversation on transgender rights are quite simply real people. People who love and laugh, hope and dream, fear and cry, just like everyone else. And when they learn that simple but radical fact about transgender people, they could no longer look us in the eye and deny us the equal protection of the laws they swore to uphold. And so in, in June of 2013, we were able to convince enough state legislators to pass the Gender Identity Non-Discrimination Act, and fortunately that night, the governor signed it into law in Delaware. But like I said, that isn't the reality in most states across this country. And so I moved back down to DC to begin working first at a place called the Center for American Progress and now at the Human Rights Campaign to try to make sure that the change we've seen in states like Washington and states like Delaware, while there's so much more work to do, to at least allow other places in this country to see the change that we've seen in places like Washington and Delaware. Now, I, I come to this fight and one of the most important stories that I share in, in my book is the fact that I come to this fight not just as a transgender person, but also as someone who's loved someone who's transgender. I met my future husband, Andy, fighting for equality, and we fell in love. I'd admired his extraordinary courage, optimism, and advocacy. He was a transgender man about three years older than me. After we started dating, Andy was diagnosed with cancer. And after radiation, chemo, and surgery, and eventually getting a clean bill of health, Andy received the news that every single cancer patient fears. His cancer was back, it had spread, and for him, it was terminal. After Andy found out that he didn't have much time left, he asked me to marry him. And of course, the answer was yes. Three weeks after his terminal diagnosis, we married on the rooftop of our apartment building in front of family and friends. And then just four days after that, he passed away. And I share that story today, and I share that experience in this book because knowing and loving Andy left me profoundly changed. He taught me how to love and be loved. He taught me how to live the values I fight for at work in my own life. But more than anything else, my relationship with Andy underscored for me that change cannot come fast enough that every day matters when it comes to building a world where every person can live their life to the fullest. After Andy passed away, I went through the different stages of grief. I went through sadness and disbelief. And then I eventually landed on anger. I'm not an angry person by nature. I, I, I find petty anger, the kind of anger that you feel when you're slighted by a friend or feel underappreciated to be kind of a waste of time and I'm a pretty lazy person. But that's not the only type of anger that exists. There's also righteous anger. The kind of anger that when met with a mission and hope has throughout history helped change the world. Andy had had the courage to come out as his authentic self at a relatively young age. He had the courage in college to say to this world that tells us that who we are is wrong, that he would not spend one more day hiding. He was supposed to have three quarters of his life as his authentic self. But because of circumstances outside of his control, he had less than a quarter. Some people have even less time than that. Hope can be limitless. Ideas can always be found. Inspiration is often endless. But time, that is the one resource none of us can afford to waste. Dr. King called it the fierce urgency of now. I was angry that society, that a hateful world, even with his progressive family and friends, had kept that time and truth away from Andy, that had kept him inside of himself for what ended up being a majority of his life. And it made me more fully realize that when we ask transgender people, when we ask any marginalized person, whether we ask people living in poverty or women or people of color or those with disabilities, when we ask anyone to sit back and allow a slow conversation to take place before we grant them opportunity and treat them with dignity, we are asking that person to watch their one life pass by without the respect and fairness that every person deserves. This is truly a critical moment in the fight for trans equality and the fight for LGBTQ equality. 
Over the last year and a half, at the federal level, we have seen attack after attack after attack on the LGBTQ community. Not to get too political, but the political is personal in this conversation. And just a few months after taking office, Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Betsy DeVos, and Jeff Sessions rescinded life-saving guidance promoting the protection of transgender students. They've appointed anti-equality extremist people who've compared being gay to pedophilia and called transgender youth part of Satan's plan. They've appointed people like that to administration positions and the federal bench. They've granted a sweeping license to discriminate to government workers, federal contractors, and even healthcare professionals against LGBTQ people, religious minorities, and women. And of course, in, in one of his most shameful moves yet, in a series of erratic tweets, although every single one of his tweets is erratic, he targeted transgender troops for his hate by trying to reinstate a ban on transgender people serving openly in the military, which is America's largest employer. But we also know that the challenges facing the trans community do not begin and end with the federal administration. 2017 was the deadliest year on record for the transgender community. At least 28 transgender people, mostly trans women of color, were killed. And while that violence has been on the rise in part because of politicians all too eager to appeal to the darkest undercurrents of American society, that hate is not new. I mentioned that a majority of states and the federal government still lack clear protections from discrimination in employment and housing and public spaces. And through it all, LGBTQ people are as diverse as the fabric of this nation. And for those living at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities, those forced to face not just transphobia, but misogyny and racism, the stigma, the prejudice, the discrimination, and yes, the violence can have often deadly consequences. In 2017, we saw over 130 anti-equality bills introduced in 30 states. I'm very proud that here in Washington, you all were able to keep an initiative off the ballot that would have targeted transgender people for discrimination. That sent a powerful message across this country that discrimination will not be tolerated by voters, by activists, by people across the state. But we still have a lot of challenges in state legislatures across the country, and the two most frequent types of bills we're seeing. The first is legislation that seeks to utilize religious freedom as a guise to license discrimination. These bills are coming from the same folks who are trying to keep people from an entire religion from entering this country, and yet they're trying to claim that religious freedom allows them to have a sphere without LGBTQ people, without interaction with LGBTQ people. Religious freedom is a core and fundamental value but religious freedom has always been a shield against government persecution for religious minorities. It has never been and should never be a sword to inflict harm on people. The second type of bill we're seeing are the North Carolina style bathroom bills, legislation that seeks to forbid transgender people from accessing restrooms consistent with their gender identity. One of the most frequent questions I get is why do we hear so much about bathrooms in this fight for trans equality? And the first thing I say is that, frankly, transgender people would rather, for the most part, not talk about bathrooms. We're talking about dignity and equality and fairness throughout daily life. But yes, that includes restrooms. It's opponents of equality that keep bringing up restrooms, and they do it for two reasons. The first is the knowledge that bathrooms are politically potent weapons. Every single battle for civil and human rights, opponents of equality have sought to center in on bathrooms in the conversation. We saw it in the fight around the Civil Rights Act. We saw it in response to the push for the Equal Rights Amendment. We saw it in the early days of the gay rights movement. We saw it in response to the effort to pass the Americans with Disabilities Act. And today we're seeing it in response to the transgender rights movement. And they understand that everyone feels a little bit vulnerable in restrooms. Everyone feels a little bit squeamish in restrooms. And when you can stoke fears, when you can take advantage of people's ignorance and lack of understanding of who transgender people are, bathrooms become fertile ground for, for fear-mongering and for scare tactics. But it's also a little bit more insidious than that, why they are focusing on bathrooms. The reason is because they understand that if they lose on every other issue, if they can win on bathrooms, if they can legislate or allow for discrimination to occur in bathrooms, it becomes the closest thing to a silver bullet to allowing discrimination throughout daily life. 
because if you cannot easily and safely access a restroom that makes sense for you, it becomes much more difficult to go to school, to go to work, to leave your house for more than two or three hours. And so these efforts are nothing more than a thinly veiled attempt to legislate and push transgender people out of public life. And we need our allies to understand that. We need folks to understand just how dangerous this agenda is for transgender people across this country. That it's not just an indignity, which is bad enough. It's not just allowing discrimination in one small area of life. It is nothing more than an effort to push us back into the shadows and into the closet. But we've also seen in response to every single one of these attacks that when a politician comes for us, whether it's Pat McCrory in North Carolina, whether it's Donald Trump in the White House, we have seen that each attack unleashes a national dialogue that only, hope, only serves to open hearts and change minds further. And in the end, it ends up sowing the seeds of the destruction of the politics of hate and the policies that they seek to implement. We saw it in North Carolina, we're seeing it now nationally, which is that when our allies stand up, when diverse LGBTQ voices are heard, when the business community speaks out, we can still defeat the politics of fear and division, the politics of discrimination and misinformation. One of the things that I carry with me in all of the work that we're doing is advice that my brother gave me in the last month of Andy's life. My brother, who's a radiation oncologist and has watched far too many people pass away from cancer, he said to me, this is going to be incredibly difficult, but take stock in the acts of amazing grace that you see around you every single day. And while it's almost a trite saying, sort of find the beauty in even that tragedy, it was a perspective change that allowed me to fa truly find that beauty, to see that hope only makes sense in the face of hardship, and to witness the little miracles that happened around me every single day. And it taught me beyond that experience that all of us can bear witness to acts of amazing grace. That even in the darkest moments, even in the most troubling times, if we look around for it, we can see acts of courage, bravery, and compassion all around us. And we're seeing it every day across this country, and the people marching and the people protesting, and folks showing up in record numbers and special elections, and people standing up against the politics of hate in ways that we've never seen before, and young people in Parkland turning tragedy into action. We're seeing that amazing grace every single day. And if there's also one thing we've seen throughout the movement for LGBTQ equality and throughout every single battle for civil and human rights in our country's history, it's that change is always possible. It's not easy. It doesn't happen inevitably. But with hard work and compassion, it is clear that we can make more tomorrows better than today. And I get to see that change every single day in my job with HRC. When I came out six years ago as transgender, it was clear that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive. And yet today, I get to meet countless young transgender kids across this country. Young transgender people like Stella, a 13-year-old from just out of Seattle, who when I met her last year and asked her what she wants to be when she grows up, she declared without any hesitation that she will be the first transgender president. What once seemed so impossible, that we could live our truth and dream big dreams, is now very real to kids like Stella. The mere fact that these young LGBTQ people exist today demonstrates how far we've come. But of course, the fundamental truth remains that no one in any community is totally equal until all of us, from the gay Muslim refugee to the queer undocumented immigrant to the transgender woman of color living right here in Seattle, until every single one of us is treated with dignity and fairness. But I know that that day will come, and when it does, when our understanding of we the people finally includes all of us, a young LGBTQ kid will grow up and learn about these struggles for justice and equality in their history books and never have to know what this progress felt like to all of us because they will never know anything different. And that will be because of advocates and activists who dreamed of a different world. It'll be because of LGBTQ people, marginalized people speaking out and stepping up. It'll be because our allies worked with us to bend the arc of the moral universe just a little bit more towards justice. So I wanna thank you all 
for having me today. I'd love to answer any questions, and I appreciate you coming for this conversation. Thank you all very much. So there are several openly trans um, celebrities, I guess you can say, uh, with like Renee Cox. Uh, um, Laverne Cox. Laverne Cox, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, Caitlyn Jenner. Mm -hmm. um, very, different. Very, very different. different. very different. Very <laughs> different. Um, any comment on, on how they um, represent the trans community or? It's a good question. Um, I think Laverne Cox is an incredible person. I think Laverne Cox is one of the best spokespeople that we have for our community, even though that's not her job, right? Her job is is to be an actor, but she has taken on the responsibility that comes with being a trailblazer with such grace and such compassion and, and, and such skill that I am perpetually thankful for folks like Laverne Cox, Janet Mock, so many others. Um, Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, is I'm very happy for Caitlyn Jenner. Um, I think on, <coughs> on the whole, Caitlyn Jenner's coming out has been a net positive for the transgender community because I do think that her coming out offered a opportunity for conversations that weren't happening in far too many places. One of the the best things that that happened that night the Diane Sawyer interview aired was that every single local ABC station also after that segment had a story about a local transgender person, right? Not Laverne Cox, right? Every single one featured a transgender person in that community. And so often we hear from elected officials, from people, um, there aren't any trans people that live around here. And that's just an absurd, it's just not true. Uh, and so in having that opportunity to elevate those stories, to demonstrate the diversity of our community, the fact that we are in every single area of this country uh, was truly profound. And I think, you know, there were, there were, se <coughs> excuse me, 70 year old people in Iowa or in Arizona who were having conversations, perhaps imperfectly, but were having conversations about trans identities and trans people, maybe for the first time around their dinner table that night. And that's how change happens. Now, I don't, for really one second, uh, agree with uh, Caitlyn Jenner's politics. And um, I would love to have a prolonged debate with her about that at some point. Um, but but I'm, tr I'm, I'm happy for her. I think for the most part, we've got some exceptional folks who are serving, as, as Laverne Cox says, as possibility models for so many young people. And that's truly incredible that there is a generation growing up that's living authentically that can turn on their television and see folks in television, in business, in politics for the first time, not just as themselves, but succeeding as themselves. And that's life-saving. Thank you so much for being here and telling your story. Of course. Um, so my sister's transgender. And she, she wants to just be perceived as female and wants to um, erase her past. So I'm wondering what's your, how do you make sense of your past? And what's it like being out, being yeah. openly accepting of your own identity? So that's a great question. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think one of the most dangerous narratives I think we have in the LGBTQ community is that everyone has to be out. Everyone has to be out. And I think that that is an unfair burden to place on an already marginalized community. I think particularly for transgender people when in existing in this world, if people know they're transgender, it can oftentimes be an asterisk on their gender and they know they can't be fully seen as themselves, which then causes pain. I don't wanna cause anyone pain and I don't wanna have to go about, one of the things that Andy always taught me, and we actually had this conversation around outing anti-equality politicians who were closeted. And Andy said to me, one, we're not gonna, we're not gonna open anyone's heart by outing people. But I'm fighting for a world where every person can live their gender identity and sexual orientation the way they need to, and that's a principle that I'm not willing to sacrifice. So I'm not willing to universalize this notion that everyone has to be out in pursuit of a principle that contradicts that tactic. And if my principle that I'm fighting for is not a first principle that I'm not willing to break, then what is? So I think we we have to get past this place where everyone has to be out. Sharing one's story can be incredibly empowering. 
I want to build a world where people can be seen as trans people and be seen fully as the gender identity that they are, right? One of the things that I always say is people write trans woman as one word, and I say, no, it's two words. My identity as a woman and my identity as a trans person. They complement each other, they interact with each other, but they don't negate one another. They don't change the other fact about one another. I'm proud of my transgender identity. I'm proud of the journey that I've been on. I think being transgender has made me a stronger, more compassionate person. I think being transgender helped lead me to find the love of my life. And I think being transgender has brought me into com a community that is beautiful and part of the rich diversity of this country and this world. Um, and so, you know, there are gonna be people for me who aren't willing to see me as a woman because I'm also out as trans. And I'm fortunate to have, I think, privileges that allow, that shield me from the consequences of those stigmas and biases. It doesn't bother me either. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't cause me pain anymore. It may be used to. Um, but for those who would experience pain, I would never want to say to them, well, you have to go through even more for a political end, even if that political end is a moral imperative. I'm not willing to require someone to live their life, to watch their life pass by, or to experience more pain in their one life uh, for this movement. There are so many other ways that we can achieve equality. So those are sort of my individual feelings about me being out, but also my feelings more broadly about not requiring other people who are LGBTQ to be out. So the, the human rights campaign does not have the best track record for trans advocacy. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. there's the scorecard for lots of large companies um, that will mark 100% this, this company is, is great for LGBTQ folks and their, their uh, medical insurance will, be, will have trans exclusion uh, clauses. And uh, if, if they can't get 100 if, they're, if they have exclusion clauses. That's, that's, that, that has changed. That has changed. Okay. Yeah. Now, sorry, if you want to finish your question, and I can respond to, to all of it. Right. I was, sorry. I was just asking um, that now that you're with HRC, what positive changes have you seen in that organization? <coughs> so that's a great question. I appreciate you, you asking that question. Um, so the first on the, on the question of the CEI, um, there is a, a requirement in the CEI that companies have don't have exclusions, that companies have inclusive health insurance. Now that doesn't always mean that every single, unfortunately, health insurance plan is gonna cover the full range of services and procedures that transgender people need. And that's an ongoing conversation that we continue to work with insurance providers on ensuring that their standards are truly inclusive of the medical needs of the transgender community. Um, but. The CEI does require trans-inclusive health benefits. And actually, we've seen in the several years since the, that aspect has been included in the CEI, and because of so many people within companies articulating and advocating for change, um, but we've seen that the percentage of major companies that are scored by the CEI that have trans-inclusive health insurance or don't have exclusions, at the very least, has gone from single digits percentage-wise to 60-something percent. Um, so, so on that front, um, the CEI, uh, I think, has, is, is always evolving and always constantly looking at what are best practices, and best practices rightfully are always evolving and changing and improving. Uh, but on the specific question of health insurance, we do, we do require that, um, uh, or one of the major elements of scoring is that there aren't exclusions. Um, more broadly, <coughs> So uh, you know, I'll be upfront about this history for folks that don't have quite the same context. In 2007, the Human Rights Campaign continued to support the Employment Non-Discrimination Act even after gender identity was stripped out by Democrats in the House of Representatives. And that was a decision that was wrong, plain and simple. I don't think there's anyone at the organization that would make that same decision twice. The organization's new leadership, Chad Griffin, has apologized for that. We have a, a principle that, will, that is unbreakable, that we will never support legislation that is not inclusive of gender identity. Um, and, um, and one of the things that I truly <coughs> appreciate about my colleagues at HRC is they understand that that was a decision that left real scars for a lot of people. And that 
changes in perspe- perceptions and that people healing from that pain and that wound doesn't, that healing doesn't happen overnight, that it takes time. And one of the things that I really value about my colleagues, both trans and cis, cisgender is a term for people who aren't transgender, is that they understand that even though there is a ton of great work happening at the Human Rights Campaign today on trans issues, that it's going to require sus- that sustained investment before people are willing to, to forgive. And frankly, they'll, they'll, they'll never forget um, that those scars are deep and they're lasting. What are some of the things and some of the work that I see right now in the human rights campaign on trans issues? First, I wouldn't go to an organization that I wasn't totally positive was 150% behind, passionate about, and centering trans equality work in their work. Um, Before I was on staff at HRC, I talked about the gender identity non-discrimination bill in Delaware. And I can tell you, without any question in my mind as the person who helped lead that effort in Delaware, that we would have not passed that bill without HRC. HRC came in with resources, they came in with staff, they came in with expertise, they came in with skill, they came in with mobilization efforts that truly allowed us to pass both marriage equality and gender identity protections within a month of each other, which is historic. And and I saw that passion, I saw that skill, I saw that commitment from the staff, from Chad Griffin on down. Uh, And I I have seen firsthand and been the beneficiary firsthand of that work. the organization is always, every organization is always on a path for growth, right? No organization is perfect. There's always more that can be done. But in terms of the progress I've seen over the last several years, trans work is probably 60 to 70% of our work at this point. Um, trans work is not just at the center of the movement, but it's at the center of the work that we do every day. Um, you know, we put, Unprecedented, an unprecedented amount of staff, volunteers, uh, and money into the state of North Carolina to specifically defeat Pat McCrory after HB2, uh, because we understood that defeating Pat McCrory would send a really important message to anti-equality politicians that if you come for us, we're going to come for you, not just the trans community, but the LGBTQ community and our allies will come for you on election day. Um, I see the amazing trans work that's happening in our foundation programs which is <coughs> working to ensure that our schools are inclusive of trans and gender non-conforming and non-binary and gender expansive students, making sure that our hospitals are becoming a bit more safer as someone who's been a caregiver and a patient in a hospital as a trans person. I know just how important that is and how much work there remains to be done. So we have a, <coughs> a team that's working specifically on expanding hospital uh, safety and access, and a lot of their work is trans-focused. Um, at the state level, For instance, there was a battle in Pennsylvania. We removed our support for a bill, a non-discrimination bill, not that that still included gender identity, but they stripped out public accommodations. And we knew that stripping out public accommodations would disproportionately harm the transgender community. And so we said we can no longer support this bill. And the bill died in part because of us and other organizations saying, this is a first principle. Any legislation that disproportionately does not protect the trans community is legislation we can't support. Um, We're hiring more trans staffers. I think the diversity on our staff, both in terms of gender identity and trans identities, but also in terms of race and religion, immigration status, all of these different identities that make up a diverse workforce, uh, that we're consistently trying to make sure that we're hiring more diverse staff, more trans and gender nonconforming people, not just in entry-level positions, but also in senior leadership positions and public positions and communications and the foundation and our legal team. Um, So I've seen a lot of progress. I'm really passionate about the work that we're doing and the fact that I didn't join an organization because I wanted to come in and, and, and try to make it start doing trans work. I came into this organization because I saw firsthand just how much they were doing and just how skillfully they were doing it. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you so, yes. so much. <laughs> I have had a cough for like four weeks, so I apologize. Um, so my question is, I like know and I know of a lot of people whose uh, opinions on trans people are like pretty uninformed by actual interactions with or hearing the stories of trans people that are often, you know, very sort of biological essentialist or very rooted in sort of dated gender theory. Um, and I was wondering how you interact with uh, people like that, people who may not even, you know, think that they know any trans people without like taking the whole burden on yourself to try to humanize yourself or make this about like 
to, to try to like convince them that trans people are real and people? So that's a great question. Um, I, I think in terms of how do I deal with it, I feel a sp particular responsibility to deal with that. And I feel a particular responsibility in the fact that I, I this is my job to, um, uh, to be willing to, to bear a bit more of that burden of humanizing and educating. I think there are a couple things. One, there are certain things that I am firm about that I'm not going to talk about, right? My personal medical history is just that, it's personal. Um, and I am pretty clear, particularly if a reporter asks me about that, that like, I politely push back and just say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable talking about that, certainly not on the record. Um, <coughs> You know, I, I, there are some people who aren't going to change their mind either ever or in one sitting. And I think understanding that and, and sort of freeing myself from that responsibility of feeling like if I don't change everyone from, you know, A to Z in one sitting, then I've failed or I'm not doing a good job. Um, I think that's been, been freeing in many ways. My approach is this. I know that there are there's a lot of ignorance out there. I know I want my I want allies to educate themselves, but I understand that like it's also difficult to not know what you don't know. And so people are going to make mistakes. People are going to come in with knowledge gaps that exist. If you're coming to me with a genuine interest, a genuine desire to understand, if there's a willingness to grow, if there's a willingness to not get defensive if you make a mistake and I politely correct you, then I'll sit and I will engage. If there's no willingness, then they can come back to me when they maybe grow the heart that they're lacking in that moment. Um, so I think, I, and I think for the most part, most people are in that, um, in, that, in that former category. I think most people are compassionate people, most people are empathetic people, that when confronted with a human being in front of them, when confronted with a story, their hearts will be opened, their, mind, their, their minds will be changed and their hearts will be opened at least a little bit. And, you know, I, and so I think that while I don't need to spend my time with someone who's, who's doing this just to troll or just to hurt, that the vast majority of people I can engage with because they, they are coming to me with a genuine willingness to have their empathy tapped. And, and I think that at the end of the day, if we do that, if we allow ourselves to do that, and if we allow people to make mistakes, but offer people the willingness to grow and the opportunity to grow, that, that will make progress. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm also from Wilmington, Delaware, and I'm also a trans woman. And we have like family connections, actually. Wait, people, really? People that I grew up with that know your family, yeah. Qu wait, uh, can I ask who? Yeah, so your brother is best friends with my cousin, <coughs> Philip. Lamplu. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Delaware is truly so Delaware's small. is really small. Every, when you every meet people time, from not Delaware, you're like, oh my God. Do you remember Charcoal Pit? Yeah, um, we've either dated, mated, or are related. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so I was in trans activism here. I'm a founder of Gender Justice League um, for Washington State. I love Gender Justice League. Dope. <laughs> you, we you, love you. And um, I, I was part of the effort uh, in front of the Senate to get the bathroom bill shut down a couple years ago. And I have since stopped doing activism because it's exhausting and draining and it, it will eat your life. And my masochism has led me to the dregs of the internet uh, to get my anger out. And so I, was, I see a lot of direct misinformation campaigns, like intentional structured toxification of communities. I see things like PragerU and you know, Jordan Peterson and these people that come out with this sort of low level soft cell disinformation for the hard right. And I wonder how aware slash concerned are people at places like the HRC, which I know you guys have legislation as sort of your main deal. And when it comes to social communities on the internet, like Reddit or YouTube comment sections, where do you guys feel like the responsibility lies to make sure that these platforms aren't used specifically um, to spread this disinformation and to sort of weaponize awful? Yeah. Um. <laughs> so to the first question of sort of how aware and concerned are we, very aware and actively engaged on the issue. Um, one of the things that, that we have tried to do is, uh, you know, there are a handful of, um, while the vast majority of the medical community and scientific community 
affirm the reality and of transgender people and the need to have access to affirming healthcare and affirm transgender identities, the validity of transgender identities. There are a handful. There's always Paul McHugh, uh, like just Paul waiting McHugh, in the right. background. Paul McHugh is a great example. Um, we have done a lot to try to engage, um, educate the media uh, to get statements of opposition from their research institutions if they're affiliated with research institutions articulating that these positions are not the positions of this institution, that this institution, you know, Johns Hopkins is a great example with McHugh yep. as a hospital too, that my husband went to as a cancer patient. And every single time we got a new doctor or nurse, we would wonder, is this person familiar with Paul McHugh? Are they an acolyte of Paul McHugh? And will that change the way they interact with Andy and me because of that? Um, and so we've actually spent the last two years trying to engage with Johns Hopkins to get them to make a clear affirmative statement that Paul McHugh does not represent the positions of the hospital and the institution, um, because those are important statements to be able to combat the misinformation that Paul McHugh, who's not a gender or sexuality specialist, but who has these personal biases that he writes about in non-scientific journals, but with a doctor in front of his name that makes it seem like he has credibility on the issue. Um, to make sure that we get these statements so that we can have them ready in courts if he's ever testifying, in legislatures if he's ever testifying, and to, again, educate the, 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 the media about why this person is not a credible person to be, to be interviewing on trans identities. Um, so we're very aware of that. There's ongoing efforts, depending, uh, Bailey, I think. J. Michael Bailey, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a whole host. There's a wonderful uh, person named Bryn Tannehill who does a lot of writing yeah, on. Yeah, I know Bryn. Bryn's great, and we work actively with Bryn tracking these folks and making sure that we're going in and, and engaging with their institutions. Um, the the second question of like the responsibility of platforms to make sure that social media and, and, and the internet is a force for good as opposed to um, you know, a force that elects the 45th president of the United States um, <laughs> is, I think, one of the most significant questions before us. How do we how do we leverage changing and advancing technologies for good and not for ill? How do we address the reality also that in this individualized media society, half of the country is truly not even hearing the other half? How do we bridge that divide, whether it's in cable news, whether it's in on Facebook, whether it's on social media, where people are going into these echo chambers, and if you're going into an echo chamber of hate, it emboldens your hate. Um, I don't have a good answer, right? That's honestly above my pay grade in terms of like what sort of what are the mechanisms that these individual platforms should. Uh, utilize or what steps should they take to address it. I do think they have a moral business, a moral obligation, a business obligation, and a practical obligation to make sure that they are truly rooting out hate speech when it occurs, uh, and violent speech when it occurs on their platforms. If they have these policies, they need to actually abide by them. Um, I think they need to make sure that, um, that if they don't have those policies, they're adopting those policies, for one. I think one of the exciting things that we're seeing right now is that the generation just behind me, I'm a millennial, the d generation that sort of are digital natives are, I think, they, I don't, I think they're doing it. I don't think they know how they're doing it, but I think they're already doing it where they're bridging that divide that exists across media and um, they're utilizing social media for good. Um, and, and, and I think this, that's going to be the generation that truly figures out how we solve what feels almost like an unsolvable problem at this point. Um, I know the obligations exist, but I don't have answers for them. Um, and, and I would certainly charge anyone who's working in tech to actively grapple with these questions, to actively grapple with the policies you have and the practices that are occurring, um, because I truly think it's probably the biggest question we face, both the use, both the, the echoing of hate on social media that emboldens hate, and also this divide that no longer allows us to operate from the from from the same fact patterns and the same conversations, and keep us from talking with one another. So it's a great question. I don't have a good answer, no, that's fine. but I'm passionate about it, and I think <laughs> Thank you. we need to address it. Right, great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming today Thank you and so uh, much. sharing your story with us. We appreciate it.